Hi hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about OpenAI Codex, but a little bit differently from the last videos, we are actually going to be talking about the do's and the don'ts of how you should be using OpenAI Codex to get the most out of it. If you haven't heard of Codex before, it's essentially a code generation model. So I could type something in like print hello world or something of that sort, right? And I have this set to Python, so it should generate us, yes, print hello world in Python. And it does it many times. Great, great, great. Now, although we have Codex here in this sort of playground area, Codex has actually been available for a while, even before the API was available and before this playground was available. Previously, it was available in the form of GitHub Copilot, which is, as you can see here, a programming autocomplete tool. And I've actually been using this for a few months now. I really love Copilot because it's actually sped up my development time by quite a bit. That being said, as with everything, you know, it has its, its strengths, but it also has its weaknesses and places where you really shouldn't be using something like Copilot slash Codex. So today I want to talk about those specific use cases and what I found working over the past few months with GitHub Copilot. To take you through the do's and the don'ts of Codex, I am actually going to be showing you examples in a real project I've been working on over the last few weeks. This is a project for essentially decoding signals in the brain. There's a bit more to it, but that's not very important. What is important is that over the past few weeks, as I've been going through this, I have been using Codex and it has been immensely helpful. So all the examples of the do's and the don'ts I'm gonna to give today come directly from what I have personally been using. So I will go back through the code and take you into places where I've used Codex and it's worked very well and other places where it has been suboptimal. Before we get into the first example, if you want to help out the channel, which I really do appreciate a lot, do consider hitting the subscribe button, liking the video, and hitting the bell icon for notifications. Without further ado though, let's get to these tips. Starting with the do's of Codex, the thing I really love the most, and oh my gosh, this is so great, is auto-completion for documentation. Now documentation, that's boring, right? Uh, and yes, it's, it's mostly boring, and that is exactly why Codex is so great when it comes to this because it's not something that's super hard to do, but it is something that can take a fair bit of time. So to give you this example, right here we have a get token embeddings function. So this is something I wrote and essentially all it does is you pass it a list of tokens and it gets the embeddings for those tokens. So here you can see I have this documentation. This itself is actually, I, th I think this was probably generated when I was working on this by Codex and we're gonna try regenerating it. As you can see, I have all the arguments listed out and the returns along with the shape of these embeddings that will be returned, which is what I like to see in my documentation or my doc strings. So if you go back here and we type, oh, look, it's already suggesting that we want to have a doc string. So let's follow that. And okay, so here it's saying return a tensor of shape length of tokens by the embedding dimension, and that is correct. So it's already getting the shape right, which is awesome. Um, so it wants to stop there, but we can actually push it a little farther and have it give us the arguments. So tokens, list of tokens, yep. Dim, uh, embedding dim, dimension of the embeddings, and device is the device to use. And then finally, we can also have it give us the return. So tensor of shape length tokens and embedding dimension. So this is all correct. As you might notice, it's not exactly what I had before, but this is very similar and it even gets the shapes right in everything. Now I will mention that this is not the most in-depth doc string, but it will do for especially personal projects and stuff, I think. It's really not too bad. A really funny thing, if you actually go to my GitHub and you look at lots of my previous projects, you'll know that I have a really bad habit of awful documentation. But if you look around the past few months, once I started using GitHub Copilot, you'll notice that my code has actually been a lot more better documented and surprise, surprise, it's, it's due to this. <laughs> I really love this. Now to item number two of the things you should be doing with Codex is you should be generating short, simple, and common things you generally forget how to do in your programming language of choice. So the example I have here is in the main file of this whole program. And in this main file, we start by loading up a config file. So you can see I specify a path to the config file as an argument, and then down here I load it in. However, whenever you're doing this sort of thing, you should really get the absolute directory 
of where you're working with or where this file is. And that's because if you call this main file from anywhere except for this current directory that it's in, well, it can cause all sorts of issues if you give a local path to the config file. Essentially, this whole path thing gets confusing when you mix relative paths with absolute paths. So one thing I always forget how to do, and I forget this again and again, and I don't know why, I can't seem to remember it, but it's getting the current directory of this file. So as you can see, I actually have a comment right here. And the reason I have this comment right here is because this is the comment I originally used to generate this code. Get the path of the config file in relation to this main.py file. And if I go to the next line here, you can see we have a suggestion. And it actually did it in one line, unlike what we had before. So config path equals os.path.join. So this is getting the directory of this file. And then we pass in the relative config file location. So this is great. Something as simple as this can actually really go a long way when you consider all those short amount of times you spend looking things up really add up and you can save a good bit of time by using codecs in this way. Next, we're on to item number three of the do's for codecs. And item number three is you should be using codecs to generate repetitive code after you enter the first iteration of what you're doing. Now, if that sounds a little confusing, this is essentially what I mean by that. So this is a file that handles some of the training. So as part of the training for this model, we need to calculate losses. So I have a function here that calculates the losses. You can see I have another <laughs> doc string generated by the lovely OpenAI Codex. And I have this sort of thing where there's actually three modules that are in this model, and I need to calculate individual losses for each of those modules. Now, you can see that here I calculate it for the first module, here for the second module, and here for the third module. So what I can do here, or what I did do here when I was making this, is I first typed out, and let me, let me go ahead and delete the rest of this. I first typed out this first calculation of the loss for this first module. And then after that, instead of typing out all these other ones, because I can't just copy and paste it because there are variables that are specific to each of these modules, what I can do is I can have OpenAI Codex generate it for me. So if I go down here, you can see it's already generating the comment. And then if we just follow this, it will generate line by line everything that we want. And not even line by line, just all the lines at once, even better. So we can take a quick look through it. You can see it's replaced SC with MC. So this is the single channel encoder that we're calculating the loss for. And this is the multi-channel encoder. And it's essentially almost replicated this, except for it's replaced all the variables that I need replaced. Now, you should be careful when you're doing this because sometimes you will actually get mistakes. Now, this is a great example of a don't. This is something you should not do, and you should not just blindly accept what Codex gives you because there are mistakes. So here you'll notice that these are pretty much the exact same except for the replaced variables. But in this case, I actually don't want this on squeeze here, even though it was in the previous example. And that's something that Codex really couldn't know, so I can't fault it. But we should be very aware as programmers as to what these you know, code completion tools are giving us. So do always be aware and do be checking that. Now, finally, to finish this off, there was one more module we need to do this for. And to do that, we can just, again, have Codex generate the whole thing for us. So give it a second. There we go. Now, here has just the unsqueeze two. We actually want the second unsqueeze. And I just happen to know this because I've already written this. But you know, if you were actually doing this yourself, it would be very helpful to look over this, take a second and make sure that it's generated the correct thing. So looking through the rest of this, it looks like it's using the right variables for this calibration model. It's replaced all the uh, we had before the MC variables with now the calib variables. So this all looks correct to me. And instead of just writing all this code, I could just have it be auto-generated. Again, there were minor adjustments we needed to make and we need to look over it, but that still is a huge time saver. So overall, for the things that you should be doing, the do's of OpenAI Codex, there is filling in documentation, generating short, simple, and common things you just forget how to do, and then generating repetitive code after you enter the first part of the thing that needs to be repeated. And finally, the last thing is that don't forget to check over the code it generates. Don't blindly accept what Codex gives you and expect it to be right because I promise you, you will run into trouble. And not necessarily just programming trouble, there is even the chance of getting into legal trouble considering it could reproduce copyrighted code. Now, in my experience, I don't think you will really see that happen very commonly, if ever, but you should always be vigilant just to be safe.
Okay, and now we are on to the don'ts, the what you should not be doing with codecs. And to be honest, there are quite a bit of things that it is not very great at. The first do not of codecs is you should not be generating very long portions of code. While codecs can generate long portions, the longer segment of code you let it generate, the larger the chance that it's going to derail and the harder it's going to be for you to notice that. So for example, here I have a wave to vec model. Now wave to vec is actually a pretty popular type of model that was brought about by a research paper and there is an implementation of it online. I think there's actually several. So this could be something that codecs might know about, not to mention I tell it that it starts off with a 1D convolutional layer and then is followed by a transformer. If so, if I give it all these input parameters, we would hope that maybe it could generate something like what I want. So let's go ahead and delete all of this. This is quite a good chunk of code right here, right? And if we have it try and generate things. So what it's generated here is actually, I must say, it's very good. However, there are a few issues. One of the first issues you'll notice is that I did in fact give all these parameters. And when you're building something out like this, you might not know all the parameters. And if I don't include the parameters here, it's gonna be a lot harder for this to happen. Another issue is that if we go back to what I originally had, let's go all the way back. What we will see is there are lots of things that did not happen. For example, I have these lines calculating this variable called embed sequence length. This variable is actually very important to my whole program to figure out what the size of the embeddings generated are, which what that means you don't need to know, but you do need to know that this is a very important variable and it was not generated by OpenAI Codex. And you know, it really shouldn't have to know how to do that. It also didn't do other things that I didn't exactly specify. For example, positional encodings, which are very important when we're dealing with transformers. It didn't create this and without this, well, we wouldn't know what order our inputs were to our transformer, which could very much impair our performance. So while it did do a fairly good job, I will honestly say, for how long of a segment of code I gave it, there were still things it left out that could have degraded the performance of this or stopped my model from working altogether. And because it was auto-generated, it would have been much harder to debug later if I did find an error later and need to come back and fix it. The second don't that I will go over for codecs is that you shouldn't be generating code where the goal of what you wanna do is somewhat ambiguous. So the example I'll give for that is actually just a little bit down here. So we've find this whole model up here, right? And we have this forward function. So if we look at this forward function down here, you can see that there is actually a lot of stuff going on. We are checking for the convolutional layer, we're transposing inputs, applying the convolution, retransposing inputs, applying a function. We do a bunch of checks to see if things are available before we apply some math. There's a lot of stuff, right? And what I wanna sort of show you all is that if we don't have the context for what we should be doing, then we're probably not gonna get anything close to what we want. So I'm gonna delete all this and just give this the function name and the parameters. And then if we try and generate it, we're gonna see what happens. So it looks like it actually doesn't, oh, there it goes. It's trying to generate something. So let's let it do this. So first of all, it's not even generating this doc string in the same format I had before. That's a little bit weird, but that's okay. And let's see, so what's happening? Well, first we're applying the embed hook function. Well, this is actually not good already because what was happening before is the embed hook function should actually be applied after the convolution. And here it looks like either the embed hook or the convolution is being applied. That again is also not good. That's not what I wanted at all. And then here we're finally applying the transformer afterwards. Not only is this not the right order of things, but it's not formatting the inputs correctly. So this would almost certainly give us an error. This is all sorts of wrong. And to be honest, we should expect it to be wrong given the fact that all we're doing is giving it the name of the function and the parameters and essentially asking it to generate the most likely code. And you know, this looks like something that might be likely, but it's not what I wanna do. And that's because as programmers, we have all sorts of things we might wanna do. And unless we make it very clear, well, Codex has no way of knowing what we wanna do. So we shouldn't be using it in cases like this where the goal of what we wanna do is either underspecified or ambiguous. We can maybe try this if I gave it a very good doc string, but even then this is fairly complex, so I'm not sure it would get it. So this is another case where you want to steer clear of using OpenAI Codex. 
Moving on to the third thing you should not be using codecs for is having codecs suggest parameters, especially if they're important parameters for something like a machine learning model. You do not want codecs to touch that, at least in most cases. So here we're back in the main file. And if you remember from earlier, we have a config file that is being loaded up. So as part of this config file, it, you know, it essentially specifies all the parameters for my model and all sorts of things. I want to manually edit some of those though and see what codecs will suggest for us and see how valid those are. And I'm gonna guess that it's probably not gonna give us some great numbers, but let's see. So what I've set up is I'm just overwriting two values from my config file. So you can see we are overwriting the embedding dimension and the max primary input length with two variables that are actually not yet defined. So we're going to have codecs define these and I'm going to tell you whether or not they're good numbers based on what I know about this problem in my model that I've been putting together. So if we go up here and we try and define embedding dimension, we can see that it suggests 128. Now for lots of things, this might work well. But for this specific problem, I can tell you that 128 would actually work terribly here. That is way too large. We are actually using very small embeddings for this problem because we are looking at data that does not have many dimensions to it. So something like 128 would probably lead us to definitely overfitting. Now let's check the next variable right here, max primary, primary input length, and see what we get here, 100. So 100 in our case is way too small, as it turns out. We are working with very small dimensional data, but sequences that are very long. So we want something like a minimum of 200, but probably something closer to 500 or 1,000 or something in the range of that. And again, we really can't expect codecs to know what we should want here. We can only expect codecs to know what we've already told it and infer things based off that. But here we haven't told it anything about our model, anything about what our data looks like. So we shouldn't expect it to know things like this. And so we shouldn't be using codecs in these sorts of scenarios where we need to specify some parameters. If you don't know what the parameters should be, Codex isn't going to know either, so you better do a little bit of work to figure out what those parameters should be without relying too much on Codex. Now onto the fourth and the final thing that you should not be doing with opening a Codex is letting it handle a whole lot of raw data that needs some sort of processing or handling done with it. You really cannot expect Codex to know what your data looks like given the fact that it cannot you know, open up the file and browse around in it. And I found that even when you do specify what the data looks like, Codex just doesn't really handle data pre-processing very well. I'm not sure what the reason for that is, but it has seemed to fail every chance I've given it so far. So here I have a pre processed data function. So this is something that takes in MEG or EEG data. So those are neuroimaging types of data and it does some sort of analysis here, right? So it does an independent component analysis, which essentially breaks the signal up into different components. No need to worry about it. It excludes certain channels, and it also scales the data so that the input is in a format that will work for neural networks. Now, I actually haven't tried this yet, but I'm gonna delete this, and we're gonna see what this does for us. So the function itself is called preprocess data, and this does say takes the position of the raw data and, or sorry, takes the target portion of the raw data and preprocesses it. So we're gonna see what it generates for us if we just let it go wild. There we go, we got a solution and let's see what's going on here. First, it picks out whether we should be using MEG or EEG, EEG data, that's actually good. And then it gets the data, puts it in a pandas data frame, and it does a few things. It removes bad channels, it filters out the data via a low pass and a high pass filter, and then it passes it through a standard scaler. So you might be asking, what, what's the problem with this? This looks pretty good. And I will say it actually has identified several things that are very common to do when you are pre-processing this sort of MEG or EEG data. EEG data. I can clearly not say that word, right? <laughs> um, but this, this actually is good in the sense that it's gotten the right general idea, but there are some issues here. Primarily the two issues that I'm seeing are that these bad channels that it thinks are specified and these low pass and high pass frequencies that it wants are actually not specified in the data. So doing this, I'm pretty sure would give you an error. So while it does have the right idea here, and it actually does get the scaling right, you know, giving it a little bit of credit, it doesn't know the exact type of pre-processing that is best for our data because it hasn't seen our data. So we shouldn't expect it to know. I guess really what this whole video sums down to, at least the don'ts section of this, is that you shouldn't expect Codex to be able to do something unless you've given it enough information to know exactly what should be done. It can sometimes infer some minor things, but you shouldn't leave large unanswered questions open when you are trying to generate this type of code. 
Anyway, that's the final don't I had. So that fully covers all the do's and don'ts of OpenAI Codex. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it is what I found over the past few months to be the most important things that you should and should not be doing. So I hope this has been very helpful to you. If you want to help out the channel a little bit, do consider subscribing. I really do appreciate it. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you next time.